Hello, everyone, and welcome to Embracing Radical Change. I am your host, Jocelyn Mercado, and today I am so excited to welcome to the event Dr. John Ryan. Welcome, Dr. John. So good to have you here. Hi, Jocelyn, and hi, everybody in webinar land. <laughs> it's really my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. So great to have you here. And for everybody who's joining us live now, please go ahead over to the chat and put your name and location in so we can see where everybody is joining us from. We always love to see that. So here in this event, Embracing Radical Change, you are all invited to join with us in global conversations with 27 cutting edge experts and thought leaders who will guide you to connect with the truth in your heart, to unlearn the illusions of our modern world, and to activate bold new perspectives about the future of humanity. So Dr. John, I'll go ahead and read your bio here just to kind of introduce you to those who may not know about your work already. Dr. John Ryan is a board certified physician, energy healer, speaker, and visionary. His life was transformed by a series of mystical events that led him to discover the validity of a spiritual and energy-based healing paradigm, his passion. In recent years, his work has led him to the mystical threshold of the quantum basis of DNA, its integral connection to the human spirit, and the potential of this awakening knowledge to support human evolution. His goal is to bring this information down to earth so everyone can benefit from the emerging knowledge available in this awakening time. He is the author of the book, The Missing Pill, and founder of Unity Field Healing, a quantum process of conscious DNA activation. And so, Dr. John, your topic for today sounds wonderful. It's called Radical Divinity, the New Human Power to Heal and Transform. Um, so I can't wait to talk with you about this. <laughs> so um, to begin, could you share with us, what does it mean to you to be radically divine? So <clears throat> radical divinity, I, I, I love, first of all, I love the, the caption or the title of this seminar, Justin. I think it, it juxtaposes two concepts. We don't tend to think of divinity as radical. Radical is more uh, revolutionary and you know, let's get out there and protest and all this kind of stuff. But <clears throat> there is a radical thing happening in humanity right now because humanity is being stirred awake to its divinity and it's beginning to integrate a whole new kind of consciousness. So when I use the term radical divinity, I, it, it's a homage or in context of this awakening. Human beings are looking all kinds of personal experiences, you know, everything from Kundalini awakenings to, you know, dream guidance to shamanic journeys and uh, encountering illnesses and, and learning how to heal them, you know, in an integrated way, understanding how to do that from the perspective of your spirit, a spiritually inclusive paradigm and an energy inclusive paradigm. And so from where we're coming from to where we're going is a, it's a quantum leap. I mean, it's a consciousness of old versus a consciousness of new. And so human beings are, are taking a journey from the old to the new, and they're bridging these two realities in their own personal experience. And that's, it's radical to do that. I mean, this has never really happened before on the earth. And the souls that are engaged in doing this, people who have had their own experiences for whatever reason that have catapulted them into this new reality and search for answers, the quest for an integrated spirituality, and so on and so forth, or the quest to heal, you know, the experiencing personal things in their life that are prompting them to look for healing in a new way. Uh, they're launched on a journey, and the journey is courageous. It takes a really bold heart and a bold mind to uh, encounter all of this and take those steps and walk through everything you go through as you do that. And what happens as you do, I mean, you learn about energy medicine, of course, you learn about chakras and healing and all the things that go along with that whole package of understanding. But above and beyond all of that, what you ultimately encounter is the validity of your soul. And you, you really come to understand that you are, whether you thought like this before or not, after you have your own experiences, you come to realize it's true to say, I am a soul, I'm a soul living in a human body. And that this is part of a, a journey that, that takes place on a much bigger landscape, you know, even out of the context of a single lifetime and these kinds of things. 
but uh, you, it's your soul that's prompting you to move forward. And historically, in spiritual terms, we've always seen spirit and God and however we've conceptualized spiritual understanding as something external to us, something we're aspiring to or, you know, uh, even groveling towards or trying to live up to in a, in a system where it would never be possible to live up to what's really expected of you to consider yourself worthy of spirit. And now people are beginning to understand that their spirituality is to be found inside them. And it, those aren't just words. It's an experience that people have where they encounter divine processes. They encounter information. They encounter a more quantum understanding of the nature of life and reality. And that the search for the creator takes you within, not without at all. So you kind of lose interest, I guess, a little bit in external systems of spiritual understanding. And you, you really take this bold adventure inward and you learn to encounter consciousness, you encounter your yourself, you encounter your shadow self, you encounter everything you need to in order to walk through the journey to feel integrated and whole so that you can embody your soul more fully and more consciously in your life. And so that's radical. That's that's not your everyday spirituality, if you ask me. <laughs> yes, definitely. I, I love how you have described this here. And, and I love the words that you use that we get to discover the validity of our own soul. Mm -hmm. That is so powerful. And yes, this idea that um, our spirituality comes from within us. And, and even I, I would say, and tell me if you agree with this, but to take it, you know, a, a little step further that it's so unique and different for every one of us. You know, yeah. what we discover in there is so different and unique for each and every one of us. It's, it is so, so true what you're saying. And I guess the way to express, I think there, there are common elements of experience and then there are extremely unique elements of experience. Mm -hmm. And you, you would appreciate the diversity of the creator. You come to realize that every single one of us is on a path, which is a common path but the journey is remarkably unique yes. and the the bits and pieces that correlate to our own process our own journey of awakening and healing and integration is you know is as diverse as life itself so it's kind of funny you know spiritual systems have always said that there are many pathways up the mountain but at the apex of the mountain there is one truth or the same truth <laughs> and I, I think it's like that for us on our you know, individual journeys of awakening. We kind of go through all kinds of experiences and, and things, and yet we're learning something that is in common too. And that is that in the middle of everything, that's we are part of that creator. We are part of the whole purpose and, and process of what life is really all about. And we're an intimate part of that, a very unique and special part. So we all have a big role to play. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So you've mentioned here in your title also the new human. Can you tell us more about what you mean by that? Yeah. So I mean, in context of what we're talking, the new human is this new awakening person. So I think the easiest way to conceptualize this really is to take a look at the bigger picture of what's happening on the planet and then understand how it affects us in an individual way. So the earth is really moving through a transition. You know, people are very familiar now with terms like the end times and, you know, the harmonic convergence and the shifting energy of the planet, and the awakening spiritual consciousness of the planet. And it gets phrased in different ways, but there's a theme of concept. It's humanity is, is really beginning to understand on a large scale, not just mystics and people who are interested in these things, but everyday people are really encountering the fact that the earth is changing and it's changing fast. And so we're shifting a paradigm. We're going from a duality consciousness where there's a tremendous struggle of light and dark. And we're going into this place of awakening light. And so the transition from one to the other is, it's a big transition. I mean, everything about life is going to be transformed by this tsunami of light, if you will, that's arriving in the process. And we can see that. I mean, you don't really need to be too imaginary, I think, to look at CNN or, you know, news channels or, you know, public media, social media, and realize everything about life is being called into question. You know, everything is in transition. Politics, 
uh, you know, healthcare, uh, human life relationships, what we value individually and collectively as a society. Everything that's kind of historic is being questioned and transformed. And, but when you're in the midst of that transformation, it's pretty chaotic. It's like everything that was, it's like someone has pulled the carpet out from under your feet, but you're not quite sure where the new world is going to land yet. And so in all that chaos, it can be very unsettling unless you have a compass or an understanding. So the earth is going through her own transition and it's, it's tumultuous. You know, there's lots of things about it are, that are difficult. And in fact, there's a resistance in many ways to the change that's imminent and irreversible. Like it, it, it is going to happen. There's no question about that. And it's going to take us to a very amazing place. But the journey there is going to have some bumps, of course, on the road because of the nature of what's happening. In our individual lives, we're being compelled to move forward the same way. And there's a realignment of energy that takes place that's part of that. When you understand energy systems, you realize for, for consciousness to expand, your whole energy system is going to expand as well. And so this process gets termed in all kinds of ways, you know, quantum awakening, awakening of quantum DNA, um, you know, uh, energetic transformation in the human body, bio-spiritual transformation. There's all kinds of terms that get used to describe this. But in essence, what's happening is the body is being upgraded. So it's in modern day, we can think of a computer, you know, you have a system and it's 10 years old and then you upgrade it for a more, a user-friendly, useful system, it works better. And there's a learning curve, but once you get used to the new system, you can see how it's so much better than what you had before. And the body and the energy system is going through an upgrade very similar to that. So things that were part of the old energy, like healing, for example, could only take place in a very certain limited paradigm. And it was a very 3D duality-based paradigm. So we relied on a lot of 3D answers, like science had 3D answers, medicine had 3D answers. As we go into this new energy and new consciousness, we're shifting and starting to realize the quantum nature of reality. And part of that allows us to access healing and transformational tools that are new in this new energy that frankly wouldn't work in the old energy. It would be like trying to pour water in a cup when the cup couldn't contain the form of the water. So it would, if people had insights and inspirations, it, it's like there was no envelope or container to really package the information in a meaningful way. But now that we have quantum language and we can talk about things of this nature and we have beautiful uh, technological tools for having visionary experiences, you know, you can see these uh, the imagery that's created by artists that show, you know, interpretations of five dimensional reality and quantum reality and all this kind of stuff, our brain can actually begin to cognize the transformation. And with that, we can begin to teach about it and talk about it in a more coherent way. So that allows us to, to learn things that were not possible to learn before. It allows us to do things that were not possible for us to do before. And all of this is part of the new energy system. So the way that this information has come to me personally is through the field of energy that is the quantum nature of our DNA. And so in the work I do, that's how I approach it. But that's one approach. There are other people who approach this information in all kinds of different ways. And everything it has its own validity because it's, either, you know, it's tools and information that's coming forward to us to be able to to understand what it means to live, to, to live in this new energy and to be a human being who gets to experience the new energy within their body and within their own consciousness experience. So the human beings who are taking the mantle of that on, if you will, or who are doing it in their personal life, they're not the same. And you see this, you know, if you look at your life today compared to what you understood life to be in 1980 or 1960, or, you know, it depends on the age of the person listening, but, you know, if you go back in time, you realize, my gosh, who I understand myself to be and what I understand about life and reality is so different today. And I'm not just talking about the wisdom of aging. I'm talking about like things that were inconceivable at that time that are part of our consciousness. now. And then I think it really shows up in the children because you see them and they, 
it, you know, if anybody has the, the privilege of seeing at least two generations of life be born, you can see with each new generation, children are changing so fast. And these new kids are kind of wired up to be part of this new reality. It's kind of the way they're born now. <laughs> but if you were born in the older energy, of course, you have to walk through the transition to get there. The kids are kind of pre-wired or, you know, they come with the new operating system already installed. <laughs> yeah. I love the computer analogy. It's uh, very fitting. <laughs> But it's a beautiful way to conceptualize it because then you can see, like, you know, it's a language we can all appreciate now. And then you realize, oh, yeah, it can happen in the body too, I guess. That makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I so agree with you on the kids. I have two little girls who are five and eight. And I, the, I mean, they teach me <laughs> so much that, you know, I didn't even know about. So it's really incredible. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's really beautiful. And people share so many wonderful experiences now. Like, you know, their children come and tell them about their last lifetime or they, you know, tell them about how they're going to solve a problem because the way they were shown to solve it doesn't make any sense. And they have a whole different conceptual way of doing it. And you can just see the light in them. Like it's, if you kind of deal with it, it can be difficult to deal with them in some ways because they're, they're so new and so inspired, but you know, they're, they can present challenges of all kinds, but, uh, you know, if you kind of understand what's happening and you stand back and observe it, it's such a miracle. Like it's really a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. So. It really is, it really is. Yes, and I think, I, I know that, you know, members of our audience who are watching today are really feeling this, what you're saying about how, how we're being shifted and upgraded and, you know, maybe we're feeling that our intuitive abilities get stronger or we're becoming, you know, aware of the of energetics more than ever before. So um this really resonates you know for me for sure and I, and I know for lots of people in the audience who i've been talking to you know and are experiencing things like this in their lives so thank you so much for <laughs> for talking about this and bringing it bringing it forward um so i'm interested in in this evolution of healing that you talked about that there are ways of healing available to us now that you know might might not have even been available to us before um so can you talk more about that? How will, how will healing continue to evolve in this new energy paradigm? Of course, I'd love to. So um, when I think of healing, I mean, he, the healing, the term healing or the word healing is used to mean so many things. We can talk about healing of uh, a culture. We can talk about healing of the physical body. We can talk about psycho-emotional healing, uh, the healing that comes along with spiritual integration and so on and so forth. And so in, in the old energy versus the new energy, healing, like we, you know, we were discussing a few minutes ago, healing was very 3D in its nature. And it could only really be understood at that level of conception. So for example, you know, if you had a, a cut on your skin, you would see the wound heal, you'd put in stitches, you'd give an antibiotic and, you know, to keep the, the wound sterile and the body would eventually just take over and do the healing process. We kind of ignored that part of the equation a lot, to be honest. But, you know, the, the response of the things we did to help the body heal were very 3D in nature because that's what we understood. And as we start to move into this new reality, this new consciousness and new energy, people have begun to realize that the body is not physical at all it's the, the physical dimension of the body is only one single dimension and even things that are physical are really founded in energy you know as we start to look through electron microscopes and discover the atoms and you know all the things that are part of the human makeup or anything that's in the physical world everything that looks material is actually energy in its basis and when we can when we really get the meaning of that we understand that nothing is as solid or as physical as it seems. In other words, there's, it can be liquefied, if you will, by thinking of it in terms of energy. The second thing is when people start to have personal experiences of healing, they begin to realize that the other aspects of being a human being, things like feelings and thought, are also energy structures. In other words, the human body has an emotional body, it has a mental body. And so there's not just the physical and then the etheric energy that's part of the physical body, but there's emotions and, and thoughts that actually structure the human experience and, and our human lives in different ways. And so healing in the last 30 or 40 years has really 
begun to reintegrate that. And so we've been talking about energy medicine and energy psychology and, you know, learning about the Eastern wisdom of chakras and meridians and all the things that have been known for quite some time and began to work on a level of energy. And with that, we started to understand the power of the mind in healing, the way we think, the way we feel or don't feel, the feelings we hold on to, the patterns of consciousness that we define as their own reality. All of these things will affect what we create as a human experience. And so everything from physical illnesses to psychological states to relational issues and so on and so forth, everything can be brought back to understanding energy and consciousness. So that whole thing was a, an incredible evolution of, of thought and understanding. Now what's happening is in addition to all of that, we're starting to understand the quantum nature of reality and the concept that our DNA has a field of energy that is part of its, its matrix or part of its reality that is connected to the soul of the individual who is in the body. And so not only do we have all of these phys physical slash energy bodies, we also have this quantum energy or this quantum information that's part of the whole system. And the way that shows up in human experience is we begin to realize we, for example, have had other lifetimes. And so people do healing work and they have memories of, you know, being a healer in another life or being killed in another life and how that may affect their consciousness in this life. And there's almost like a bleed through influence from experiences that are, are not even in context of what you know to be your realities as an individual human being. Right. So this information has to be somewhere. If we think about it, it's not just floating out there and you randomly happen to access it somehow. It's actually part of your energy system. And so each one of us as a soul has this Akashic connection. We have a memory of everything we've ever lived, you know, in terms of a soul or a human experience. And we're not limited to what we know ourselves to be in a single incarnation. And so the other kinds of things that might be in this quantum arena of information are the things that we we've talked about all along. Like, for example, if you have a purpose in your life, where did that purpose get created? Like, when did you make that purpose? And how do you carry that information? It's not just in your brain. It, it comes from a deeper place or a more soulful place within us. Or if you have certain attributes, you know, like if you're, you see this again in children a lot, you'll see some kids are very active and they love to be physical and they love to be outdoors and they love to be nature. And then other kids love reading and books and knowledge. And, you know, uh, other kids like to be playful and, be creative and have artistic expressions and some kids don't like that but they're mechanical and they'd love to take apart any toy and put it back together <laughs> so you kind of see aptitudes you know that are innate within the person and you can begin to appreciate how all of that is in the quantumness of who we are as an individual expression of the creator and it's tied or connected to what our purpose really is and what our potential really is in an incarnation and with the shift of energy that's happening, we're becoming really open to this. And not only are we becoming open to it, we're becoming influenced by it. So because in our Akash, we have the memory, for example, of a perfectly healthy state, then we can actually use that connection. We can kind of mine the Akash, if you will. We can go into the, the memory, the greater memory of our soul and bring forward potentials of healing that we didn't have within us when we were more limited in our expression. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we can go backwards and mine it out and pull it forward and, and reset our body or reset our experience back to what we perceive as healed. And to me, healing is really a restoration. It's within us, we have the natural wisdom, the natural understanding to make everything be aligned in a in a balanced and beautiful way but we have to want it we have to aspire to that you know within our own individual experience and when we do when we set ourselves to the task if you will of doing that this is what starts to happen people start pulling these potentials from out of the blue and if you understand the system of energy the akashic system i teach a lot about that in the workshops i do and in the healing work i do 
so that we can really understand what this system is really all about and that this is the mechanism, if you will, by which it can happen and come forward. And so for that reason today, people can heal things through consciousness and energy that wasn't accessible before because we didn't really have an understanding of how it might happen. I thought, but it would be very exceptional and we wouldn't, we couldn't rely on it, if you will, you know, to evoke healing, and to evoke transformation, but that's changing now. And that's really what I see is what's new. Okay. Wow. That's all very exciting. I hardly even know what to, um, what to ask next. Cause I have so many, there were so many interesting things <laughs> there. <laughs> um, but I, I think, that, <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Uh, but I, I think, I mean, so this idea of, you know, these, this information that is stored in our DNA um, and that, so would you say we're, we're gaining greater access to this? Like it's always been there, right? But we're just gaining greater access to it now. Yeah. Um, what, what advice, and I'm sure you go into way more detail on this in your, in your workshops and different teachings, but what advice would you have at a top level for people wanting to learn more about that or, you know, um, kind of begin accessing healing in that way. So to begin accessing healing in that way, so two things. One is ask, ask your soul, because within each one of us, our soul will always guide us to what really will be the next most important step in our own reality. And so the best answers really always come internally. Now, that doesn't mean they originate internally, and I'll explain that. So say, for example, we ask our soul to help guide us on a path, and then we have this inspiration to go to the bookstore, to attend a workshop, Mm -hmm. and we follow through on that intuition. It's like an internal prompting or an intuition that kind of guides us to do that. When you follow through on that, it'll bring you to information that you didn't know existed. And I I have a very poignant example of this in my own life. I I started to live a Kundalini awakening years ago. And I I didn't know what Kundalini awakening was. I didn't even really think in spiritual terms. I was a a scientist and in medical school and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then I started to have these experiences and I, I didn't know where I was going to find the answer for what I needed in my life. And I woke up one morning with this huge intuition it was so like pressing on my mind go to this bookstore and so i knew it existed it was a holistic uh, kind of a new age type bookstore in the city where i was living and off i go and i go in and i look around and i to be honest Jocelyn, i was overwhelmed i remember it was a, it was an old kind of a mansion style house and it was full of rooms and every room was full of books and i kind of thought oh my gosh how am i ever going to find what i need here and I was, I was so overwhelmed, I almost just wanted to turn around and walk back out the door. That's the kind of feeling that it was. And, but anyway, as my eyes panned across the room, I had an experience which is familiar to us today, again, through technology. You know, on a computer, how you pan over an icon and the icon magnifies as your mouse runs over it. It gets bigger and highlights, hey, I'm here for you. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So as my eyes went across a bookshelf in this bookstore, there was a book that literally doubled in its size. And I went over and I thought, oh my heavens. Like, and when I pulled the book out, the title was The Spontaneous Awakening of Kundalini by Gopi Krishna. Wow. And so it's just a beautiful illustration to show when, when, you, when, you're not, when you're seeking and you need answers and your soul knows you need the answers. If you have that internal system of having intuition and following through and experiencing the synchronicities that it leads you to, that's the best guided system anybody can evolve. And then if someone gives you advice or experience, you have to weigh it through the filter of your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so if someone says, oh, you should do this, or you should do that, or you should see this or see that, feel it first and know within yourself whether it resonates with you or it's right for you. And so we have these two compasses that we can kind of always work with, and it will bring us to what's really tailor-made, like very specific to where I am on my journey. I've I've written a book called The Missing Pill, which is kind of a, it's a big journey through the whole story of energy healing, right up to understanding quantum medicine. 
And it's written in, in terms that everybody can understand because I found a lot of the material when it was written, it was either above or below the level of access that people needed for information. So I tried to put it together in a way that was natural for my understanding to make it alive for people so that they could read this and really get what energy healing is really all about. So someone who's specifically looking for information on that, that's a, a resource that's available. So, but again, people can, you know, muscle test or trust their own intuition as to whether that is the right next step. But that, that's the best answer I can give to that question because it really is the way it always works. So. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a wonderful answer. And your book is, is fantastic. I have read it and I can highly recommend it to everyone who's interested. And I, I love your perspective as a medical doctor, you know, bringing forward what you've learned about energy healing. I, I just found it really, really powerful. No, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So um, what does it take then in, in these times as we're going through our, our radical changes and wanting to heal ourselves in many different ways? What does it take to radically heal? And it may be what you've just addressed here. But. <laughs> Let me see what I would say. I think what it takes to radically heal is to have a radical heart you have to kind of go into the space where you realize how incredible life is, how incredible your life is, no matter what the experience you're living, whether it's good or bad right now at this point in time, how precious it is just to be alive, to be part of this transition, to be awakening to this transformation, to be living experiences that prompt you or drive you in that search. And again, some of those are good experiences and some of them are challenging ones. You know, it can be illness or different kinds of psycho-emotional experiences and dark night of the soul kind of experiences and all this kind of stuff. And so, but just to realize how utterly precious it is to be alive, to be a soul and to have the opportunity to, to live that. And then the second thing is open yourself to your soul's guidance. So when you really begin to listen inside and you allow, you, allow, you, you allow yourself to give yourself what you need in order to, to go forward, which is sometimes unsettling because it shakes up the foundation of our realities a little bit. You know, like you might be in, in a job and it's really not nourishing your soul and yet you rely on it for stability or financial support and you're trying to make a transition and you have to be there with yourself in a really conscious and supportive way you know while you live through that transition um you you have to be ready and courageous you know to take on these kinds of experiences and that kind of courage takes heart we tend to think of it as mental in our in our modern day you know we're very mental in our orientation and courage is of the mind but but true courage is really courage of the heart. It's the willingness to stand up to the truth inside of yourself and to, to be authentic in a way that allows you to discover who you really are and what your purpose is and what your healing potential is and what your future can be if you align your heart with, with that truth. And so it's radical, <laughs> but it's heart-based. It's really, it's, it's really something that emanates from inside. And then you begin to realize you're part of a system and so, you know, for example, we're here together in a group having this conversation. Well, how did this happen? So this happened, if you go back, you know, a few steps in the journey, I've had my experience and the things that have happened to me. You have had your experience and the things that have happened to you. You've been divinely inspired to, to make a public forum where people could get information and tools and resources and things that they need to help them on their journey. We make an appointment to have this. People come and join and be with us, and we're all together having this conversation. And so you can see the divine orchestration of that, you know, and that can be missed, but it's really what's happened here to make this all possible. And when you see that, you, you realize there's a system there to support us, and it, it's there in a way to bring things to us that we don't always know even exist. 
And so when you really get that, when you really cognize that and you understand it, you realize how alone you're not and how much is available to us. And so if we align our own heart and our own journey with it, then everything we need will come to us in some way. And, you know, it takes time sometimes, like for things to be orchestrated on the 3D level, if you will, of reality. So you might get, you might put out a call for help and it might take two weeks to return to you or three weeks to return to you for everything to click into place to give you the answers that you need. But it's there and you begin to feel supported and you feel like you're integrated within a system that's taking you under its wing and it's trying to walk you through this change. And so when that really happens, you there's a peacefulness that comes with that. You, you relax into it because you realize you don't need to know. You don't need to know your next step even. You don't need to know where you're going. You just have to be open to the signs, the symbols, the synchronicities, everything you need that will show you the way. And you have to, being open that way is really important because you have to always remember what you're looking for, you don't know. You know, like if, we, if we're looking for an answer, we're always framing it in context of what our mind already understands. But some of the things our spirit wants to bring to us are so out of the realm of anything we've understood <laughs> that unless we have that faith and trust and openness, it can't, we can't really get to the answers. Do you know what I mean? So, yes. um, you know, it, it's a bit of a long-winded answer there, but I think, I think we've touched on some important points so that people really get the essence of how that all works. Yes, definitely. And it's so true that, you know, part of what wants to come through to us is something that we cannot even conceptualize yet. Yeah. So staying open in that way is so, so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And this idea, this, this knowing that we're not alone, I feel like that is so important. I know that has been such a critical part of my healing. Um, over the years, because I had, for most of the beginning of my life, I had anxiety and depression just constantly until I was in my early 30s. And when I realized and started to have these synchronistic events happening to show me that we're not alone, that I am guided at every single step, that we each and every one of us is so guided and supported, um, you know, that's what really changed everything for me. So I think that is just so important to keep, <laughs> keep reminding everybody. Yeah. We are each and every one of us so guided and protected. Yeah. Yeah. It can't be overstated. I agree. Yeah. Yes. So, well, this has been wonderful. Thank you for all that you have shared here. Um, I wonder, is there, what, what is the most important message that you would love for everybody to, to take away from what you have shared with us here today? I think the most important thing always it's always the same message in a way we can we can verse it and, and put it in different words and, and in different conceptual understandings but the most important thing is to know you are divine to understand that within you there's a soul you're intimately connected to the creator everything about your life is purposeful and meaningful good or bad and it's all meant to take you on a journey that will bring you back to the truth inside you. So when we're really on the path of that return, when we start to really get it that we're souls, we're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences, we're actually spirits having human experience. And we reverse the polarity of that thinking and we begin to behave like that. You know, we live our life like that's really the truth. <laughs> you you create magic because you're you're in alignment with the system you're not working against the spiritual system if you will and so by doing that there's a power that comes and the power is a, it's it's love on one level but it's also strength it's courage it's guidance it's inspiration it's wisdom it's synchronicity it's powerful intuition it's a whole system that steps in to take you to the very next threshold of what's possible for you in your life. But it really only opens up that way when we open up that way. And I think that really begins with the seed of understanding your divinity. When you really let that sink in and you let it start to blossom you know, inside of you, magic really starts to happen. 
And I think that'll always be the most important message I ever want to give. Really wonderful. Thank you. So I know um, we ha I think we have a lot of people wanting to ask questions. So don't worry, everybody. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But I want to um, just talk for a minute here about your free gift that you are going to be sharing with the audience. Um, would you like to say a few words about that? Uh, yeah, sure, Justin. So there, part of the work I do is what's called unity field healing. And it's, it's a quantum energy based work. And it, it's really a system to help. It's a tool, if you will, for recalibrating the energy system, the system of energy that exists, say, between the divine soul and the human body. And so the work can be used in healing in the context of fixing things or healing things that are problems or troubles in our reality. But by establishing this energy link or this system, we also look, can look forward and we can use the energy system to create and to manifest different things that are not just simple, simple healing, because healing often implies trying to get over something you know, or getting through something or getting past something. But we also want to create, we want to create a reality that's reflective of our health and, you know, abundant in all the things that are truly important to us and, and so on and so forth. So the energy system is, it's, it's two ways you can access it. You can do it through audios that are meditatively guided audios. And there's three sessions that are part of the whole system. And so for, if people uh, click in and uh, send an email to the, to the competition, then three people are going to be selected to be given this, this, this system of energy healing for free. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I am putting that link in the chat right now um, for those who are on live. And then for those who are watching this as a recording, just scroll down a little bit below the video that you're watching right now, and you'll see the link there to enter for the, um, the drawing for three winners of the Unity Field Healing audio sessions. Um, okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. John. So um, let's go to the Q&A now. And so anyone who wants to raise your hand and ask a question, just look for the hand icon at the bottom of the screen that says raise hand. And you can go ahead and um, raise your hand and we'll bring you over on video to talk to Dr. John. Or if you don't want to come over on video, you can always type your question in the chat or put it in the Q&A box and we'll get right to it. Um, there was a question, somebody asked about the earlier interview with Lorna and so she wasn't able to show up you know, at the time we needed. So I just want to let everybody know I'm going to be recording that with her probably next week. So I'll get that out to everybody. Um, okay, so let's go. There's a question in the, oh, there's a question in the Q&A box. Um, Colleen, do you want to raise your hand and ask a question? I know you've asked here a few different times if you could ask a question. So if you want to, go ahead and raise your hand. And anybody who would like to, this is your chance to ask Dr. John Ryan, your questions. So go ahead and raise your hand now or ask in the chat. Let's see, everybody must be shy today. Okay, here's a question in the Q&A from Colleen. Okay, she says, I was raised as a strict Christian and I still attend mass every week. How do I reconcile this with my belief in the Akashic Records? Wow. So that's an amazing question. <laughs> so this is my take on this. When we look at religion and spirituality together, I honestly believe that every religion on the planet today is founded in the absolute truth. So when you go back to the teachings of every religion, if you go to Christ or you go back to Buddha or Muhammad or you know, all the various sacred texts, texts back through time, you can see that these were people of a very divine and inspired consciousness that came forth as messengers. And they were bringing a message of potential. They were bringing a message of divine possibility. They were bringing a message of transformation to, to humanity. And we can think of them as like, elder brothers and sisters, if you will. There, there, there were beings who carried tremendous wisdom and tremendous light, and they were bringing this to share with the planet. 
And so religions have founded around all of these core teachings. And so when you look at the teachings that are in the religion, they are profoundly true. And so there's no, there's absolutely no paradox in my mind to someone who finds a connection in a religious affiliation or a spiritual system that they connect with personally and they feel brings them closer to the truth within them. And so I know lots of people who are very spiritual in their thinking and they work in energy systems, but they still love to attend mass or go to a spiritual service of different kind. And they find that personally, you know, by doing that, they reconnect with truth and teachings and that they really get something from that experience and being part of that community. And so there's no reason for anybody personally to feel that they can't mesh the two together in their mind if it's a really important thing for them. Other people kind of lose the connection with religion because they have personal experiences that push them away from the the system more than the spiritual teachings. So they might have a conflict with the religion or the organization of the religion or some of the things that the religion teaches versus the spiritual message that's really the, the core of the, of the religion. And so when you look at Christ's teachings, for example, they're pure truth. He talked about everything you need to know to go into this new energy. And what he told us is that it's to be found inside of us. We can take this within our own hearts and minds and we can evolve in this way by taking on the mantle of the Christ. And so his message was never to, you know, revere me or revere the crucifixion or to revere the church. It was to revere the truth. And so people can be in religion and still revere the truth, I guess is the, the simplest way to put that. And so I think each person has to find their own peace with that. Where people do run into more conflict is in being free in their own thinking that way, they may not be tolerated or accepted by other people who are more strictly religious in their thinking. And so that can create a whole other level of conflict or, or you know, problems for people. And so I tend personally, I don't get into those arguments with anybody. I just live my own truth and I do my own thing. If someone asks me a question, I answer honestly, um, but I never try to change anybody else's mind. It's like each person has to decide for themselves what's, what's appropriate. And so that's how I handle that dynamic, I guess, in a personal way when I encounter it in my own life. Yeah, that was a really good question and a wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Okay, let's see. I think we have another question in the Q&A here. People are feeling shy today, I think. Nobody's putting <laughs> their hand. <laughs> um, Let's see. Oh, so Colleen, who asked that first question, she just said, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Erhard is asking, can you say something about that to any physical body is linked an energetic body? Oh, okay. I guess, can you say, can you speak more about that, that, that all of our physical bodies are also linked to an energetic body? Sure, yeah. So... If we, people who've had the experience of seeing energy or seeing the energy fields of the human system will report common things. So we, we, we all know we have a physical body. That one's pretty straightforward. You know, you can see it or touch it or feel it or, you know, have a very direct experience with it. The etheric body, most human beings do not see it. So it exists, but we can work with it indirectly when we do things like acupuncture and acupressure and this kind of stuff or tapping. People are really working with the etheric energy of the body and doing that. And so it's a whole level of energy that exists inside the physical body that's invisible to the body. And the easiest way to conceptualize that is to think about a magnet. So if you had a metal magnet in your hand, there's an electromagnetic field that's part of that magnet that we don't see when we look at the metal magnet. But if you put a piece of paper over the magnet and sprinkle iron filings over it, you'd see this beautiful torus that forms around the magnetic bar that's made through the energy structure that is invisible when you look at the magnet in a 3D kind of a way. And our physical body is kind of like all these filings that pile up on top of the energy. <laughs> so we see the physical body, but we don't see the energy system that's holding it into place. 
And then, but as people develop clear vision or have experiences of, you know, this third sight vision, many people will see the third body different, but most people do not. So don't, don't think you need to, to have an appreciation of it at all. But it is true that some people do see. We also have an emotional body and we have a mental body and we have what are called higher spiritual bodies that are part of the human system. And they all kind of co-mingle, like they're all within the physical body, but the energy bodies tend to shine out a little bigger than the physical body. And so it creates what people refer to as an auric field or field of energy that's emanating or radiating from the body. But we can appreciate that they exist in layers and the energy bodies do different things. So when you feel a tremendous joy in your heart, for example, in science, we tend to attribute that to, to neurocognitive function. We'll say it correlates to a part of the brain. But when you live it as a human being, you don't live it in your head. You live it in your heart. It's where you feel it. It's where you feel that joy and where you feel that expansion. And so you're literally feeling your energy body as you have that experience at that point in time. And so these energy bodies are part of the energy system and they are part of every human being, every, everybody has them, and they are functional in the way that correlates to what they do. So there's lots of beautiful diagrams and pictures, or again, in my book, I go deeply into this in a couple of chapters, both from the perspective of what the bodies are, and then what healing means in the different kinds of bodies that we have. And uh, so it's a short answer. You can answer it a little better with pictures and diagrams, but uh, I think that gives a, a context of what the answer is. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. Wow, we have some very interesting questions. <laughs> I almost want to give you your, a selection between them so you can pick the ones you... But, um, well, here's a good one that I wonder if you, you know, would like to broach. So can you explain how distance Reiki works? So, yes. So when you understand the bigger energy system, we, we start to understand there's a quantumness to reality. Now, I'm not a quantum physicist, and you don't need to be a quantum physicist to understand the concept of the field, if you will. But the easiest way to think about it is like this. If we look at 3D structure and we reduce it down to the smallest elements, we get down to like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and, and everything is kind of made up of these elements, you know, the periodic table of the elements from chemistry class. But science in the quantum domain has really developed this ability to think inside the atom. So you go into a, a space of energy that is subatomic. And the physics that exists in that subatomic realm is very different than the physics that we know in the 3D realm. So for example, in this world, we have, in this level, we have electricity and magnetism and gravity and you know, the laws of velocity and speed and all those things that everybody forgets from high school and science classes. <laughs> but there are physical laws that govern how things work in the 3D world. On, in the subatomic realm, things work very, very differently. And so there's a field in which everything exists and commingles. And intention is a very important part of what happens in that field. And so when you intend for something to happen or when you observe something as a human being, the consciousness that you hold is instructing the field to respond to the intention. And so it's kind of one of the forces by which things get created. So for example, if you hold an intention strongly in your mind, you're literally attracting, if you will, or drawing the energy to you to have that experience. So when you're doing distance Reiki, you can think about it as going into the field. And so we're, we're not limited the way we are in the 3D laws of physics, we're going into this space of consciousness where things can connect at a speed and velocity that's outside the realm of time or distance. And so you're meeting in this field, you're meeting in this space of consciousness and your consciousness is coming together to do the process or the work that you're doing. 
And so anybody who's had experiences with remote healing of any kind, whether it's Reiki, uh, the, the work I teach, Unity Field Healing can be done remotely as well. And so when you're doing it, this is what's happening. You're going into the field space and you're connecting in that interdimensional space to have the intention or to experience the intention for which you're meeting there. And that's the simplest way I can understand, I can explain that, but I think it makes sense. Yes, definitely. Okay, let's see. We do have Robert. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. I like that one. I was interested to hear the answer. (laughs) Okay, so Robert, I'm going to bring you over. Ask your question. Okay. Hi, Robert. Hi. Hi, Hi, Robert. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) I'm enjoying uh, the session. I've recently been drawn to doing drumming. Yeah. Um, as, as, as part of Celtic shamanism, but also the, um, the indigenous drumming. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, it, it's coming and going. I'm getting words, but not the entire set. Okay. Can drumming be used as a gateway to healing and higher consciousness? Oh, what a great question. So absolutely, yes. So when you're drumming, you're doing two things. So Drumming is very, very powerful because it's a rhythmic vibration. And when you understand what you're doing when you drum, the drum is creating a sonic wave. And so at the etheric level of reality, when we're drumming, there's like a sound wave that's being pulsed into the 3D matrix of energy. So spiritually, we can use drumming to access our own higher states of consciousness or collectively in a group to bring in a field for healing or for transpersonal experience. So we can use it on our own. And this is why it's always been used by shamans and you know, people in indigenous cultures to, to access this level of consciousness and understanding and to bring new possibilities into this realm of reality. So absolutely, yes, it's very powerful and it's a tool for doing exactly what you asked. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. That, that confirms my intuition. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank question. you, Robert. Great question. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's see. A question that so um, the same person who asked if there is if every physical body has an energetic body is asking if quantum physics can prove that there's an energetic body. Is that something that quantum physics deals with? Do you know? It's starting to. So when this will really happen is in the future, when there's technology that has the capacity to see quantum energy. And so that, it, that's coming. It's not developed yet. I mean, we're into quantum computing and these, th- these types of things now. But the day will come when we have the technology to energetically see the energy that is quantum in nature. And when we do, we'll be able to turn that on all kinds of things. We'll be able to look at DNA, for example, and see the energy field and system that's quantumly part of the DNA molecule or the human body and to see the energy fields that are quantumly part of the human system. But right now, technology is not there. I mean, the closest thing we have to that are these special cameras that can take curly images of energy and these types of things. But that technology will uh, catapult into unbelievable places in the next number of years. And then when that's possible or when it exists, we'll be able to see the energy. By now, it's only being done by experiments of inference. So for example, There are experiments that are done that show that DNA can print light patterning that exists after the DNA is gone, or that molecules can come into coherence and then have an influence on each other once they're again separated in space and time. So there's these kinds of experiments that show there has to be a quantum relationship between molecules or a quantum nature to certain kinds of molecules But that's where science is with that right now. Okay. But in the future, we'll see the energy, and then the answer will be yes, more direct yes. Yeah, okay. (laughs) We're getting there. Yeah. (laughs) 
Okay, I'm gonna bring Abby over now. She's raising her hand and then Mike, you'll be next after Abby. Have to take a minute here, there we go. Hello. Hi Abby, we can hear you now, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question, is there um, a practice that you would recommend to anchor into the safety that I need to be able to ground into and, and, and embody, move forward? To, to, to be safe and anchored so that you can move forward safely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the best answer to this question, there are many things you can do. But the, the first and most important thing is to understand the truth of what you're actually asking. So if I were to tell you that you are without doubt a divine being and an emanation of the creator's love and light, and you're here on earth for a purpose, and there's nothing that can happen to you that you do not permit, that's the space of comfort that we're moving into in the new energy. So when Christ, for example, encountered Pontius Pilate, and Pilate was threatening to, you know, have him crucified and all this kind of stuff, Christ's response to Pontius Pilate at the time was this, there is nothing that you could do to me that is not ordained by a greater, greater God than my Father in heaven. And so... If you look at that experience in isolation, you, may, you might ask the question, if Christ was such an evolved being, how could he have experienced something as terrible as the crucifixion? But in, on the level of his soul, he had ordained this experience because he knew he was part of a much bigger story. And he knew that it would, that would only happen to him if it was truly ordained as a necessary part of the tale. Otherwise, it would not happen to him. The creator would never let anything happen to him that did not have the utmost importance on his spiritual journey. So are the safety we're looking for comes from the knowingness that only that which is really ordained by our soul will happen to us. Now, I challenge what I'm saying myself to say this. That doesn't mean we all have to go out and experience crucifixions of all different kinds. The energy of today is very, very different. And the energy of what we're experiencing now is propelling us and pushing us forward in a way that's safe into this new energy. And so it comes from you knowing who you are and what you carry inside of you and the trust that God really has your back. Not as some spiritual hope, but the truth inside your body. Do you see the difference? And then the second level of that is to anchor your energy to the earth. Because the earth is really our mother in energetic terms. And so our body is part of the earth. And the more we integrate into earth consciousness and we merge with the elements and with the sacred consciousness of the, you know, the divine mother, both as a spiritual entity and as an earth-based entity, we are becoming part of the planet in a way where it will guide us. We'll know where to be to be safe. We will know where not to be to be safe. We will know which way to turn when we get to a fork in the road. There's a guidance system that will be part of the planet that will direct us each and every step of the way. And it will come through our intuition and through direct experiences. So the answer is twofold. Know who you are. And secondly, anchor into the earth. In very simple terms. And by doing that and really realizing the power of those two things, you'll see that your safety is a very natural, natural way of being. It's, it's given to you and it's part of who you are. Wow, thank you. Abby, are you, are you with us? Did you hear that answer? Um, I did, and um, I find it a little disturbing, but maybe that's just me. Um, okay. Do you want to tell us why you feel that way? Um, because it kind of negates the whole embodying it in the physical experience that is part of what I'm here to do and to be dismissive of, of that experience. Sorry, I don't understand, Abby. Uh, how, what do you mean?
I mean, it is possible to have that knowing without personal physical experience of safety and still find it unaccessible. Still have that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to put it in words. It's, it's a vibrational thing and it's so very discordant. Let me, let me continue the answer a little bit because the last thing I would ever want to do is disturb you. And, I, and what I'm saying is not anything about disembodying or not being in your body. None of these things can happen anywhere else other than in your body. So, for example, your soul, the more it is incarnating in your body, what's happening as we go through this ascension of energy is your soul is more fully incarnating in your physical body. Right. So instead of existing above you or outside of you, it's becoming a very integral and conscious part of you to the degree that it is really just who you are. So in your body, that is who you are, and you manifest that through your physical form. And the physical form is extremely important. When we think of ascension, for example, historically, it was almost like we would have to lift off the planet to ascend. But the, what's happening in the energy today is it's not what, that we're ascending. We're ascending in consciousness and energy, which is happening through the physical vehicle. So the energy is coming down and merging with your body and being part of you. And the more deeply that you really know that and, and understand that, cognize it, if you will, or accept it, the more powerfully your soul is present in your body, the safer it is. Does that make sense? On one level, yes. Um... So your body is a very important part of this process and journey. It, it's really important. And then your body is part of the earth. The elements in your body all came from the earth. The new, you know, everything physical about your body is part of the elements of which the earth is made. So you know, everything we eat and consume and so on and so forth goes into making up our physical body. But all of that comes from the earth. And in that sense, as we connect with our spirit, we realize we're part of the system of the earth. We belong here, that the earth is our mother. We're children of the earth, if you will, and children of spirit at the same time. And so the, there's a union that takes place between what is physical and what is spiritual. And in that space of union, we have guidance and the guidance keeps us safe. It will teach us what we need to know or what we need, what decision to make or where we need to be and so on and so forth. Does that make better sense? Yeah, and, and that, that happens. That's happened to me throughout my life. Good. And it makes the separation from that that much more painful. Exactly, right, exactly. And so that separation is diminishing because it's going away as we become more integrated. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the question, too. It was, really, it was a good one. Yes, thank you, Abby, for your question. Hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, let's see. I think we can take one more question here. So, Mike, let me bring you over. I know you've been waiting patiently there. Hello. Hi, welcome, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hi, Dr. John. My question is, I've had a, a number of curly and photography photographs, and I know a lot of other people have. What is it we're looking at when we get our curly and photogra photography? So I, I think the, the technology of curly and photography is, is, is getting better and better all the time. I've seen examples of curly and photography in recent times that more closely mirror what, what we see when we see with our energetic vision. And so I believe we're really seeing the energy systems of the body. It's often etheric energy that we're seeing. So for example, if you have a leaf and you, you know, you have the leaf is torn, but you still yeah, you can see that too. Uh -huh. You're seeing the etheric form of the leaf, but you're, what you're seeing is the quantum radiation. So it may have a mixture of elements of energy in it, but it's predominantly the etheric form of energy that we're seeing from what, from the examples that I've been shown. Anything that's alive would give off this energy? Absolutely, absolutely would. 
Because when what an etheric form is, it's a pattern or a structure of energy that has to exist as a field for the form to grow into it. So for example, when we see the, the etheric pattern of the leaf, it looks like it was produced by the leaf, but it's really the other way around. It's the etheric form of energy is present, so the leaf grows into the pattern. It creates the patterning, the energetic patterning on which the form can manifest. I see. I'm not that good at seeing auras, but I can feel them. Like when right. I get in near a person with a really strong, good aura, I feel good about them, you know, I feel comfortable yeah. with them. And yeah. other people, it just like they push away you know you, you can ask them a question and it's like you're not even there they can't even hear you you know they're, they're not on the same frequency as you are yeah i understand and uh and yeah and people will approach that in different ways so people you know there's all kinds of any one of our senses has a correlating esoteric sense so we can have clear vision clear audience you know clear sentience and so on and so forth. and people tend to be much more in tune with their sentience than, than having these visionary experiences through the third eye and this type of stuff. And uh, so that's, but that it's part of the awakening and it, it's really how a lot of people approach energy things. They do it through the, the perception of feeling and sentience and it can be very, very powerful when you trust it that way. And uh, so that's amazing that you're having that experience. <laughs> okay. Well, I've seen orders before sometimes, but I feel them a lot more, you know, my feeling, I don't know, what do you call it, kinesthetic? Yeah. It's much more sensitive than my sight. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Cool. Keep it up. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. John. Really my pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your question. Have a wonderful day. You too. Ciao. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Okay, well, thank you so much um, for being here and for answering all of these really amazing questions. Uh, this has been very fascinating. Your questions are fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so yes, I just so appreciate you uh, making the time to join us here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jocelyn, and, and thank you. Again, thank you too for all you do because it's, it's so beautiful and important what you're doing to bring people together this way and have the opportunity to share and and learn and discover um, it's worth its weight in gold. So I just really want to, uh, from my heart to yours, a big thank you to you and to everybody listening today as well for joining me. Thank you so much, yes. And thank you everybody for joining us live and also for those who will be watching this as a recording. Thank you for tuning in and opening your heart and, and opening your awareness to what is possible. And um, I know I, I learn so much every time that I talk with you, Dr. John. I really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. really my pleasure. Okay. Well, thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, you too. And I'm sure we'll be in touch again sometime soon. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>